Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 22nd of September 2022. The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. With this, we can enter into our discussion. Have a look at this editorial article. The author in this article has expanded his views on how the objectives of the preamble, especially fraternity, is achieved or lost in the contemporary India. This is the crux of the news article given here. So, in this context, let us discuss about each and every objective of the preamble in detail. Before starting our discussion, have a look at the syllabus that I have highlighted here for your reference. Now, let us begin our discussion. Firstly, what is a preamble? See, in general, a preamble is an introductory statement in a document. This preamble explains the document's philosophy and objectives. Similarly, when you take it in a constitution, it presents the intention of its framers, the history behind its creation, and the core values and principles of the nation it tries to build. Now, coming to the preamble present in the Indian constitution. The preamble of the Indian constitution stands as an identity card of the constitution. The ideals behind the preamble to the Indian constitution were laid down by Jawaharlal Nehru's Objectives Resolution. Note that the resolution's modified version forms the preamble of the present Indian constitution. Now, just have a look at this image. This is the preamble of the Indian constitution. What all can you see in this? You can see that the preamble reveals four ingredients or components of it. What are they? Firstly, it reveals the source of authority of the constitution. Now coming to the question, what is the source? It is the people of India. This is what is clearly stated through the phrase, we the people of India. Secondly, it reveals the nature of the Indian state. It states that India is a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. Here you have to know one important fact. See, while adopting the Indian constitution, only three characteristics were mentioned in the preamble. Then subsequently, by the 42nd constitutional amendment, two more characteristics were included in the preamble. They were socialist and secular. Now, coming to the objectives of the constitution. They are justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. This is what we are going to discuss elaborately in our today's discussion. Now, let us see the objectives mentioned in the preamble one by one. Firstly, let us take justice. Justice stands for the rule of law, absence of arbitrariness and a system of equal rights, freedom and opportunities for all in a society. Thus, establishing justice means to have rights and administrative laws that are just and fair to all its citizens. The term justice in the preamble embraces three distinct forms. They are social, economic and political. This is secured through various provisions of the fundamental rights and directive principles. Note that the ideal of justice that is social, economic and political justice has been taken from the Russian revolution. Now let's take social justice. It denotes the equal treatment of all citizens without any social distinction based on caste, color, race, religion, sex and so on. It means absence of privileges being extended to any particular section of the society and improvement in the condition of the backward classes and women. Now, coming to economic justice. It denotes the non-discrimination between the people on the basis of economic factors. It involves the elimination of glaring inequalities in wealth, income and property. Here note that a combination of social justice and economic justice denotes what is known as distributive justice. Lastly, coming to political justice. It implies that all citizens should have equal political rights, equal access to all political office and equal voice in the government. This is all with respect to the term justice. Now moving on to the term liberty. See, the ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity in our preamble has been taken from the French Revolution. The term liberty means the absence of restraints on the activities of individuals by the state. And at the same time, it also means providing opportunities for the development of individual personalities. Here, you have to understand two different concepts of liberty. Coming to the first concept, positive liberty. It means presence of an atmosphere in which an individual can fully develop to his potential. Here, the state has an obligation to have to provide the necessary conducive environment. Now, coming to the other form of liberty, which is known as negative liberty, 
it denotes the absence of external limits imposed on the individual by the state this is all regarding the term liberty now let us take the term equality the term equality means the absence of special privileges to any section of the society for example let us take article 14 c article 14 basically states that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of india now let me explain this to you in brief firstly take equality before law it basically means that all persons should be treated equally no matter whether they are poor or rich male or female thus state cannot provide any special privileges to anyone in the country it is also known as legal equality and note that the expression equality before law is a negative concept this is because it implies on the absence of special privileges that favor any individual now coming to the term equal protection of law it means everybody who resides in india should get equal protection of the law it requires affirmative action by the state towards disadvantaged populations here note that affirmative action program of india that is reservation has constitutional basis in this particular term lastly coming to the term fraternity this is what the article speaks elaborately about now let's see the meaning of the term fraternity fraternity means a sense of brotherhood the preamble of india declares that fraternity has to assure two things one is dignity of the individual and the other is the unity and the integrity of the nation note that the word integrity has been added to the preamble by the 42nd constitutional amendment the phrase unity and the integrity of the nation embraces both the psychological and territorial dimensions of national integration it aims at overcoming hindrances to national integrations like communalism regionalism casteism linguism secessionism and so on the constitution tries to promote this feeling of fraternity by the system of single citizenship fundamental duties also say that it shall be the duty of every citizen of india to promote harmony and the spirit of common brotherhood among all the people of india this is irrespective of religious linguistic regional or sectional diversities thus we can conclude that without fraternity there will not be unity and integrity in a nation and to achieve this fraternity basic objectives like justice liberty equality has to be achieved and always have in mind that this liberty equality and fraternity works in a trinity that is without one the other becomes meaningless this is what exactly dr b r ambedkar said in the constitutional assembly debates here also note that india tries to promote global fraternity through the presence of articles like article 51 through this discussion we have discussed detailly about each and every objective of the preamble with this let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this article it says that indian space research organization isro successfully demonstrated a hybrid propulsion system that used a solid fuel and liquid oxidizer as per the article hybrid propulsion system was tested at the isro propulsion complex located at magendragiri this is the essence of the article given here in this context let us understand some basics about propulsion system first of all know that there are four major components to any full scale rocket they are the structural system the payload system the guidance system and the propulsion system in this discussion we are going to concentrate only on the propulsion system see the propulsion system of a rocket includes the parts that make up the rocket engine what are those parts they are nothing but the tank pumps propellants power head and rocket nozzle from this itself you would have found out that the function of the propulsion system is to produce the necessary thrust so coming to the question why thrust is needed thrust is the force which moves a rocket through the air and space thrust is generally generated by the propulsion system of the rocket see different propulsion systems develop thrust in different ways but all thrust is generated through the same application of newton's third law of motion i hope you all remember what is newton's third law for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction see in any propulsion system a working fluid is accelerated by the system and the reaction to this acceleration produces a force on the system 
and this force is used to move the rocket upwards. Now, going a little bit deep, we are going to see what will be going on inside a rocket. In a rocket engine, fuel and a source of oxygen called oxidizer are mixed and exploded in a combustion chamber. So, there are two parts, one is fuel and the other is oxidizer. Fuel is the substance that burns to create the expanding gases that power a rocket engine. So, burning of fuel runs the engine. But why is an oxidizer used? In order to burn the fuel, we need oxygen, right? That's how combustion occurs. But in the vacuum of space, there will be no oxygen to help ignite the fuel. So, an oxidizer is used. Oxidizer provides the necessary oxygen for the combustion to take place. See, the combustion produces hot exhaust which is passed through a nozzle to produce thrust. Now, coming to the categories of rocket engines. See, there are two main categories of rocket engines. They are liquid rockets and solid rockets. In a liquid rocket, the propellants, the fuel and the oxidizer are stored separately as liquids and are pumped into the combustion chamber of the nozzle where burning occurs. But in a solid rocket, the propellants are mixed together and packed into a solid cylinder. This is where today's article becomes relevant. Today's article says that hybrid propulsion system is tested with HTPB based aluminized solid fuel and liquid oxygen oxidizer. Here, HTPB means hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene. It is said that the hybrid system is more efficient, greener and it is safer to handle which paves the way for new propulsion technologies for future missions. That's all regarding the hybrid propulsion system tested by the ISRO. In this discussion, we saw about the propulsion system and the categories of rocket engines. With these key takeaway points, let us move on to the next article. Take a look at this news article. This article reports about left-wing extremism in India, which is otherwise called as Naxal insurgency. See, yesterday the Director General of Central Reserve Police Post, CRPF, said that Bigar is now free of left-wing extremism. He also said that, in jargon, the fight against Naxals is in the last stages. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about Naxal movement in India, its objective, prevailing areas of Naxal insurgency in India, and finally the reasons for the decline of Naxals in recent times. Before getting into the discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is highlighted here for your reference. See, the Naxal movement was initially started as a rebellion against local landlords by the peasants over the dispute of land ownership. The rebellion was started in a small village of Naxalbari in the Darjeeling district of West Bengal with the aim of rightful redistribution of lands to the working peasants. Note that the term Naxalism derives its name from the village Naxalbari. The uprising was led by leaders such as Charu Majumdar, Kanu Sanyal and Jangal Santal. For decades, they have waged guerrilla warfare against their targets such as landlords, business people, politicians and security forces. Know that the guerrilla warfare is a type of combat that is fought by a civilian population or other people who are not part of a typical military unit. This is all with respect to the background of the movement. Now, coming to the objectives of the Naxal movement. Their main objective is to capture political power through armed struggle. They openly proclaim their lack of faith in the democratic means of election and use of violence as a means of achieving their goals. Their main goal is to grab rights over water, forests, land and mineral wealth. This is what their main objective is. Now, let's see about the reasons for the sustenance of the movement till now. The main reasons behind the rise of the movement was the lack of development in the tribal belt of mainland India, despite being mineral rich. Here, tribal belt of mainland India means the central and eastern parts of the country. These areas were neglected by the government for developmental initiatives post-independence and there was also mismanagement in the administrative machinery. The tribal people occupying these areas were routinely exploited for their mineral rich land. Also, illegal encroachment and the deprivation of rights of forest dwellers over their own land further aggravated the situation. The alienation and social exclusion led them to feel disconnected with the government and with the larger society. 
all these conditions have contributed to the evolution of left wing extremism in india now specifically talking about the regions of naxalism as we all know that it initially started in the state of west bengal but later this militant movement spread out of west bengal to different states like andhra pradesh bihar chatisgarh jharkhand karnataka kerala madhya pradesh maharashtra odisha tamil nadu and telangana have a look at these images by seeing these maps you can see a reduction in naxal affected districts Now the movement is almost suppressed in states like Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh and Bihar. The government troops are continuously striving to wipe out the Naxal extremism in the remaining regions of India. Let's see the reasons for the reduction of Naxalism in India recently. First, the central government has rolled out a national policy and action plan on left wing extremism in 2015. This policy bridged the gaps between security forces and the local people through personal interaction also the policy strived for the development of roads installation of mobile towers skill development of tribal people improving the networks of banks and post office and also finally strengthening the health facilities the government of india allocated 11000 crores of rupees in 2017 to build road connectivity in 44 naxal affected districts in india this helped the security forces to occupy the affected regions faster now coming to the second initiative of the government this initiative is known as operation samadhan expansion for each letter is given here you can pause the video and take a look The chief objective of the operation is to ensure participatory governance and protection of the rights of the tribal people. By using these developmental initiatives, government stopped the supply of fresh manpower to the Naxal groups. This in turn affected the operational efficiency of the Naxals, which led to the reduction in their activities. So, these are the two reasons for the decline of Naxalism in India recently. Through this discussion, we learned about Naxal movement in India. its primary objective prevailing areas of naxal insurgency and finally the reasons for the decline of naxals in recent times with these key learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this article this article says that the karnataka legislative assembly passed the protection of right to freedom of religion bill 2022 popularly called as the anti conversion bill In this context let us see in detail about the important provisions of the anti conversion bill firstly the bill provides for the protection of right to freedom of religion and prohibition of unlawful conversion it says that no person shall convert or attempt to convert any other person from one religion to another by practice of misrepresentation force undue influence coercion allurement fraudulent means or by promise of marriage but the bill also says that if any person wants to reconvert to his immediate previous religion then that conversion will not be deemed as a conversion under this act now coming to the question who can lodge a complaint about conversion see the bill states that any converted person his parents brother sister or any other person who is related to him by blood marriage or adoption may lodge a complaint about conversion know that the bill says that any marriage happened with the sole purpose of unlawful conversion shall be declared as null and void by the family court when the family court is not established the court have jurisdiction to try such cases and note that every offense committed under this act is cognizable and non bailable now coming to the punishment part a jail term of 3 to 5 years and a fine of rupees 25000 has been proposed for those violating the law apart from this a jail term of 3 to 10 years and a fine of rupees 50000 has been provided for those converting minors women or persons from sc st communities additionally the bill envisages a compensation of rupees 5 lakhs to the victims of conversion by the persons attempting the conversion and there will be double punishment for repeated offenses now you may ask does this mean no one can convert into another religion the answer for this question is no see people can follow any faith but the bill lists certain declaration to be provided before conversion 
the bill says that any person intending to convert to another religion should provide declaration to the district magistrate at least 30 days in advance the religious converter who is carrying out the conversion must provide one month notice and the district magistrate will conduct an enquiry through the police on the real purpose of the conversion and after conversion the person who gets converted should inform the district magistrate within 30 days about the conversion after this he or she must appear before the district magistrate to confirm their identity here note that not informing the district magistrate will lead to the conversion being declared null and void these are some of the important provisions of the anti conversion bill i'm going to give you one additional information other states in india that have similar law for anti conversion include odisha madhya pradesh arunachal pradesh chatisgarh gujarat himachal pradesh jharkhand uttarakhand and uttar pradesh through this discussion we came to know about the important provisions of the anti conversion bill with this let's move on to the next article discussion have a look at this news article this news article talks about property tax it reports that only 52% in the limits of greater chennai corporation have paid the property tax so far this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us discuss about property tax who has the mandate to collect it and also about the importance of property tax see first of all what is a property tax property tax can be defined as the annual amount paid by a land owner to the local government or the municipal corporation of his area the term property includes all tangible real estate properties house office building and also the rented spaces for example the municipal corporation of a particular area assesses and imposes the property tax annually or semi annually the tax amount is based on the area of location of the property size of property property type etc now coming to the importance of imposing such a tax on the citizen see the local governing body will use the collected taxes to fund water and sewer improvements the tax amount is also used to provide effective law enforcement fire protection road and highway construction for the particular area in addition to all this it is used for education and health purposes and other services that benefit the community thus the collected amount is mainly used for public services like repairing roads construction of schools sanitation activities etc thereby benefiting the citizens either directly or indirectly here note that india collects very little amount of property taxes in this regard the 15th finance commission suggested the states to raise property taxes to increase their tax revenue it also noted that in india property tax collected is only 0.2% of its gdp while oecd countries had nearly 1% of their tax revenue coming from property taxation here oecd means organization for economic cooperation and developments make a note of this point this data can be used by you while writing the main answer with this we have come to the end of this particular discussion through this discussion we have seen about the term property tax and who has the mandate to collect it and the need for the collection of such tax with this let's move on to the prelims practice question discussion today we have two different questions taken up for the discussion now coming to the first question let me read out the question for you consider the following statements regarding propulsion systems statement 1 in solid propulsion system only the fuel will be solid but the oxidizer will be liquid coming to the second statement in liquid propulsion system both the fuel and the oxidizer will be liquids the question asked for the correct statement statement 1 is incorrect we already saw in our discussion that in a solid propulsion system both fuel and oxidizer will be solid and it will be packed as a single cylinder so statement 1 is incorrect statement 2 says that both the fuel and the oxidizer will be liquids in liquid propulsion system which is correct this is the correct definition for the liquid propulsion systems so the correct answer for this question is option b two only now moving on to the second question let me read out the question consider the following statements statement 1 in india property taxes can be transferred to the occupant of the property statement 2 says that property tax is a type of direct tax the question asks for the correct statement 
Statement 1 is incorrect because property tax is a type of direct tax so it is to be paid only by the owner and not by the occupant. Coming to the second statement. This statement is correct. Property tax is a type of direct tax. So the correct answer for this question is option B. 2 only. I have a main question for you displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer for this question and post it in the comment section. With this we have come to the end of our discussion. If you have liked the video, hit like, comment and share with your friends. If you want to see further videos like this, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy.